So people often send me different types of EMP bags to test for shielding effectiveness. So today I'm going to take a look at two of them. Uh, one of them is this Mission Faraday bag, and the one that I have is the large duffel bag. Um, and it looks like a very good quality bag. Um, I like the feel of it. It seems, seems very durable. It has this sort of gold metallic liner inside. And uh, overall, it looks like a really great quality product. So I look forward to testing it and seeing how it does in terms of shielding effectiveness. And then the other bag is uh, a different sort of design. This one's by Survive Tech. And it's, uh, it's a little bit different. It's also very heavy duty. It feels like it would really last a long time. And I like, I like it. It's got a little poucher for maybe some papers. Uh, or some other small things that you'd want to store. And then it's got a, um, an inner lined bag. And it looks to me like a very similar material, maybe not exactly the same, but a similar gold type metallic material with this inner pouch. Now this bag's not quite as large uh, as that giant duffel bag is, uh, but it's still pretty good size and it will be large enough for me to run my tests. Now with either of these bags, um, since there's a metallic liner inside, you might want to pay attention to not putting exposed electronics with, let's say, you know, a metal antenna on it or a, an exposed charging port, something like that. You really don't want the metal of your electronics to come into contact with the inside of the bag. So the uh, Survive Tech bag actually ships with uh, some of these conventional anti-static bags. Now, th these particular ones have a Ziploc top, um, which in my testing at least, haven't done a great job of shielding by themselves, but when combined with another bag, you get two layers of protection. I suspect they would do quite well. And the advantage of using an interior bag like this is it gives you a, an insulative layer between your product and the inside of the bag. So you could use something like this with either of the two different bags, and I think it would be to your benefit. It would give you additional shielding, and it would also give you some protection against maybe shorting exposed metal against the inside of the bag. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to test both of these bags at the same frequencies. I'm just going to pick three frequencies. I'm going to go at 100 megahertz, 250 megahertz, and 500 megahertz. And I'll just measure first in, in free space to see what the basic levels are in the room. And then I'll put the spectrum analyzer inside the bag and take a second measurement. And comparing those two values will tell me what the shielding was. So I'll do those three values just to get as a sampling of what, how the bags might perform against high frequency signals. Now, I will say I could test at lower frequencies, let's say 1 megahertz or 5 megahertz, but those signals would be blocked quite easily, and also they wouldn't couple well into small-scale electronics. So they're not really of any risk or worry to me for small-scale electronics. It's really these higher frequency ones that we're most concerned about, and that's why I'm going to test at these high frequencies. All right, so I'll walk you through the test setup, and then I'll show you the, the data that we get. So my setup for today is I have a frequency generator connected up to a high power amplifier connected up to a broadband antenna. And that will let me adjust the transmit frequency um, that I'm going to broadcast towards the shielded bag. So what I'm going to use to measure the level is a portable spectrum analyzer. So I'll take one free space measurement first just to see what the signal level is uh, just in the room unprotected. And then I'll place the spectrum analyzer inside the bag and I'll take a second measurement uh, to determine what that level is. And by subtracting the two when measured in decibels, I can determine what the shielding effectiveness of the bag is at that particular frequency. All right, so let's start uh, do that. We'll start at 100 megahertz and see what the shielding is. So the first baseline measurement will be made at 100 megahertz. I'll go ahead and turn on the signal generator. You can see the level rise up. Now the spectrum analyzer is set to capture the peak level. And that level looks to be, if we zoom in here, right at, oh, let's say minus 31 dBm. Okay, so the reference level for 100 megahertz will be minus 31 dBm. Next, we'll measure the free space value for 250 megahertz. Okay, zoom in there and see what that is. Looks like that one is about Oh, let's say about minus 24 dBm. And finally, we'll measure the free space value at 500 megahertz. So if we zoom in there, looks like we get about minus 24 dBm as well. So, so we'll start the test at 100 megahertz. We'll go ahead and we'll place the spectrum analyzer inside the uh, Mission Darkness bag. And we'll go ahead and see what level we get when I turn on the generator. 
All right, now to see the level, I'll, I turn back off the generator, but the spectrum analyzer camp captured the maximum value. So I'll have to go and go ahead and open it up here. And I'll zoom in. And what you'll see is that at 100 megahertz, there's no detectable signal which means that the, the bag blocked the signal enough that the level is down into the noise and we can't really measure it. So that level right now is minus 95 uh, or so, and our original baseline measurement was minus 31. So it provided at least 64 dB of shielding at 100 megahertz. I'll repeat that experiment at 250 megahertz and we'll see what the level is. So go ahead and turn on the generator. Turn it back off, we'll go ahead and open up the bag. And what you see is that the level is right around minus 75 dBm. So our baseline measurement was minus 24 we're at minus 75, let's call it 76 maybe. That would give us about 52 dB of shielding at 250 megahertz. Finally, we'll repeat the test at 500 megahertz. I'll go ahead and turn on the frequency generator. And then we'll go in and see what value we get here. So it looks like we get uh, right around minus 58 dBm. So our baseline measurement was minus 24. So we're getting about 34 dB of shielding at 500 megahertz. So now we'll take a, a measurement with the spectrum analyzer inside the shielding bag. And we'll go ahead and start at 100 megahertz. Let's go ahead and turn on the carrier. All right, we'll go ahead and zoom in. And what you see is that the signal has dropped uh, into the noise. So it's below a level where we can read it. So we were at minus 31 dBm, and now we're at at least, oh, let's say minus 95. So we got at least about 64 dB of protection at 100 megahertz. Next, we'll make a shielded measurement at 250 megahertz. I'll go ahead and turn on the carrier. And then we'll zoom in and see what level we see. All right, so that looks like about minus 76 dBm. So our reference measurement was minus 24. So we have 52 dB of shielding at 250 megahertz. Okay, turn back off the carrier and we'll zoom in. And you can see that the level is right at minus 60 dBm, minus 60 dBm. This is at 500 megahertz. So the reference level was minus 24. So we picked up 36 dB of shielding at 500 megahertz. Okay, so I've completed the testing of both of the different bags. And, and both of them actually performed almost identically, well within the margin of my error. Um, so I would say in terms of protective ability, uh, both were equally well performing. So, and it's not really any surprise because it appears to me that they use a similar, if not the identical uh, material inside to, to protect and shield them. And they both have a rollover lip that you roll over twice and Velcro down. The same closure mechanism, same, or same or very similar materials. So you would expect uh, shielding that was also uh, comparable. And that's exactly what we saw, is that when we did the two different sets of tests, we got values that were, by and large, the same values uh, for both bags. And, and so I still like both bags. I think they're very good quality. Um, I certainly could recommend them. I think they're, they're great. So my recommendation in terms of EMP bags, whether you buy inexpensive ones, uh, such as these, these bags, and I don't recommend these by themselves, these Ziploc ones, they're just you know, usually not quite effective enough. 
Um, but whether you buy, let's say, good quality anti-static bags like these, uh, like the dry shield bags that I've recommended before, or whether you buy something, you know, a little heavier duty, uh, like the Survive Tech bag, or something, you know, heavy duty and gigantic, um, like this Mission Darkness bag, um, what you really want to do is you want to achieve at least 50 dB of shielding across all the frequencies of interest. Now, what frequencies of interest? Maybe from 100 kilohertz all the way to 1 gigahertz. Now, the low frequencies are extremely easy to block, and I'm sure any of these bags, uh, quality bags, would block those no problem at that level or greater. And in fact, that's what we saw. When we tested at 100 megahertz, both bags essentially dropped the level so low that it was down in the noise. So it was greater than 50 dB, significantly greater. Um, and you would expect for low frequencies that would be the case. Now, as the frequency started to go up, let's say we went to 250 and then we went to 500, you started to see that the shielding effectiveness comes down on these bags. And the reason is, is that the material, the, the shielding material is not a solid material. It has small pores in it, and that lets in some of the RF energy. And that's not surprising. That's very typical of shielding materials. And that's why you want to try and do a layered approach if you're going to do this type of shielding, maybe an interior bag followed by these rugged exterior bags. And that would be the way I would recommend it. And that will certainly get you to 50 dB or greater across the entire frequency range of interest for an EMP. All right, so that's my recommendation. If you're going to go cheap, get something like the dry shield bags. They're a few bucks a piece. But if you really want something, you know, durable that you can carry on your back or, you know, put in a in somewhere that you're going to be able to go in and out of it numerous times easily and you want something really rugged, I think both of these bags are great. Um, I think the Mission Darkness bag, you know, is, it's really high quality bag. It's got a good liner. This one in particular is really large, which is great if you're carrying a lot of stuff. And then this Survive Tech bag, also equally high quality bag, very durable feeling. Um, I like the clear pouches so that you can see, put some things in here that you could see. And then it's got an interior bag that's protected as well. So both of these bags are really, really, I think, high quality bags, and I would recommend either one of them. But again, if you're going to use either one, I do recommend that you use some kind of liner that also provides additional shielding at high frequencies, such as these anti-static bags. Um, and you might look for the very best ones. Uh, the ones I found are the very best are the dry shield bags, either the dry shield 3000 or dry shield 3400 bags. Those are the ones that give really outstanding shielding across frequency. All right, hope that was helpful.